The Earth Optimism Summit is a celebration of success in conservation so that we can learn from what's working, scale it up, and do more of it. None of us should feel powerless uh, to, to change the trajectory of how humans uh, care for the Earth. I don't know that I've ever been at anything like this, where all day long we're hearing stories about solutions. It's a great example of how we can use technology for conservation and how this amazing democratization of science and technology has given us the ability to increase the scope, scale, and the potential of solutions that never were before possible. So I'm thrilled, overjoyed to see a lot of young people here because that's going to be the people who I'm going to be following. They are our future. And I believe they're going to do better than we have done. We can make our planet a better place, but we can't do it alone. If each one of us, individually and collectively, will follow the path of scientists and artists and conservationists and other citizens, our neighbors, we will make it. We can take a huge bite out of climate change emissions while helping to protect biodiversity and bring it back. You don't have to have a PhD to see the change immediately. You don't have to be a scientist or a well-known artist to see the change immediately. We all can see it, and so that's the beauty. Anybody can take action to make a difference to make our world healthier for ourselves, but also all the other species that inhabit the Earth. I feel like I need to prepare them for the world that they're going to be voting in, the world that they're going to be moving into. Inspiring! And creative. Awesome! It's really inspiring. Special. It seems sort of insurmountable. But the only way you can do it is just put one foot in front of the other. If you have an idea and you're really committed to something, you got to damn well do it. And now, please welcome Executive Director, Smithsonian Conservation Commons, Ruth Anna Stolt. First of all, we have to thank Discovery Communications for that incredible starter this morning. Jen Cortner is in the audience somewhere, but she walked around all weekend with a team. And they, they picked up all this amazing stuff we didn't even know was going on because we were so busy dealing with the 250 speakers who'd come in from around the world to tell stories. Um, and I just want to give a shout out uh, to them I also want to give a shout out to, I had to bring my little piece of paper, uh, a really important group of people. Uh, we had seven people working around the clock for the last three or four months to put this together because the, it, it took us, once we got permission to go forward with it, we just had to work day and night. The reason it worked was because we had Nalu Creative working with us. And Nalu created this beautiful logo for the summit, pro bono, before they even had a contract with us. Um, I want to thank the voice of God who introduced me, <laughs> um, Rebecca Coons and her whole team. They really blew it out for us. And last night, I did not introduce an important person who worked at night when we were all trying to get our sleep. Salema Castro came after hours and picked up after the rest of us. So if she's here, I just want to thank her from the bottom of my heart. And the rest of you, rest of you, you know who you are. Uh, I also, and, and now I am really excited about this. Um, to introduce Bill Curtis. Uh, many of you may know him as the voice of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He's also the iconic anchor voice from uh, Anchorman, the Anchorman movie series. And, but a lot of people don't realize he also worked with the Smithsonian long ago uh, following scientists around. But he has spent his entire career covering stories and telling stories about innovators and scientists, and there's nothing he isn't interested in learning. We were so thrilled when he agreed to come here this morning and interview and host some of the legends of conservation. You're just not going to believe this group. They're back there telling stories. A lot of them knew each other way back when. And we also have some young scientists he's going to interview at the end. So we're going to have kind of the, the people who've been working in the trenches for decades 
tell about their ups and downs. And then we're gonna have the new people come along and then we're gonna turn and move toward the future. So we want to thank Bill Curtis and please join me in welcoming him to the Earth Optimism Summit. Thank you, Rich. Well said. <laughs> Always let the music fade naturally, you know, before you start talking. This is like a reunion to me because uh, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, I did a series for PBS, 100 shows called The New Explorers. And in doing that, I met uh, a lot of the scientists that you will meet today. I was very much into it until it became difficult to uh, get funding, both out of PBS and uh, $2 million a year for a budget. Uh, so I said, well, does anybody else want me? Unfortunately, it led me to uh, murder and mayhem for cold case files on a and &E and investigative reports and American justice, but once a convert to conservation, always. So I bought a ranch in Kansas. Uh, I've got about 10,000 acres in conservation easement. And a little bit later, started a company of grass-fed beef, which was more difficult than I thought. And I had no business doing that, uh, but uh, it was uh, rewarding. And if you come to Chicago, you can get some. And, uh, you know, kind of wrapped it up. Uh, how I got to Anchorman, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But to get it out of your system, you may be familiar, more familiar uh, with that than anything else that I have done. There was a time, <laughs> a time before cable when only men read the news. And in San Diego, that man was Ron Burgundy. <laughs> but back to science. I have two goals. One, in the limited time that we have, to put as much information in your laps as possible. And um, we have the great ones to do that. So, may I introduce our first expert guest, Robert Stanton, former director of the National Park Service, a good friend of mine when I was on the board of the uh, National Park Foundation. Bob. Thank you. Good to see you. Bob is the uh, Michael Jordan of the National Park Service uh, and has all the answers. When I was there, I seem to remember that we were about $8 million in arrears to, for the national parks. Uh, and yet we all knew that they were the jewel in the crown of America, a great schoolhouse uh, for conservation and just recreation for everyone else. Mm -hmm. What's the status now and conservation as you see it from your days? Thank you, Bill. But let me first of all uh, commend the uh, organizing sponsors for this great summit. And secondly, to uh, congratulate you on your continued leadership and commend you for your support of uh, the nation's national park uh, when you served uh, as a member of the board of directors of the Park Foundation. The Park Service, uh, as when you were a part of the foundation, uh, was experiencing a significant uh, backlog uh, in infrastructure improvements, neighboring at that time between 7.5 to $8 billion. I think that number has uh, grown to about $10 billion because new parks have been added that have some needs as well. Uh, I'm optimistic that there will be a continuing addressing of this concern uh, by uh, the administration, by Congress, and certainly the uh, continued increase in philanthropy, donations from individuals and corporations, in-kind services as well as cash. Uh, I, uh, I have to be realistic, though, that uh, it will take a while uh, to bring all the parks up to the highest standard because uh, eight to $10 billion is a lot of money. And about a half of that would be allocated towards improving uh, roads and bridges, uh, recognizing that some of our road systems are over 120 to 130 years old. Witness uh, Yosemite or Yellowstone. Uh, so it's a major effort, but I, uh, I remain optimistic yes. uh, that uh, those concerns be addressed. It's pretty basic uh, what we need there, it's roads, basic. Uh, facilities to stay. I feel as though I have just dived on Valens Reef and walked in the rainforest in that virtual reality booth <laughs> of Conservation International down there. And you were talking about new 
technology yes. that will allow a walk in the forest yes. from the Tetons or Yellowstone right. to be seen in the middle of Chicago or New that York. That is correct. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And I remember one of the problems that we had was how do we get especially minority students yes. and young people into the parks? Yes, yes. We are now a nation of, I believe, 317 million, as indicated by the 2010 census. We are a very diverse society. We are highly urbanized. Uh, and unfortunately, there are some citizens who have not had the opportunity to visit some of the larger parks. But in an attempt to address that, uh, Bill, uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 70s, and continuing to the mid 70s, new parks were created within the urban environment. Uh, take Gateway as an example in New York, Golden Gate in San Francisco, Chattahoochee in Atlanta, Cuyahoga between Akron and Cleveland, Santa Monica, Los Angeles. Parks in which uh, young people, adults, their parents could literally walk to those parks and they are to be maintained in the highest standards as well. But we would hope that uh, while uh, virtual reality uh, is a way of introducing our diverse citizenry to parks, uh, I'm a little biased, there's nothing like experience in a park firsthand. Nothing like reality. <laughs> hey, I like that. <laughs> so reflect if you can. <laughs> Uh, reflect, if you can, back over the years, and distill for us what can now be done. Bill, let me put it in a context, and I would have to sort of personalize that uh, with one who is at that tender age of uh, three scores and 16. People want to add that up quickly. I've seen a lot of changes. I came from a different society than many of our people in the audience for 24 years. I lived under the uh, doctrine of separate but equal. And I will tell you there was nothing equal under those circumstances. So a lot of progress was made. And uh, I remain optimistic that while we dealt with those uh, social inadequacies, uh, that we can deal with those as well in the environmental uh, movement. Uh, what I have been pleased to see over some 40 plus years being associated with the National Parks and the Department of Interior uh, even though we may be confronted with some difficult economic times, uh, some social unrest or what have you, there is a continuing love for the pu public lands, which are really our inherited treasures. Uh, visitation continued to increase. Uh, volunteerism continued to increase. There are over 200,000 individuals who volunteer daily uh, with the National Park Service. Uh, donation of property, donation of funds, corporate sponsorship, increased collaboration and cooperation. Uh, a more diverse workforce in terms of minorities and women, uh, that all give me hope uh, that uh, all will be well, uh, notwithstanding that there seem to be some time that we step back before we go forward. But uh, I am very optimistic. I'm glad to hear that. I always felt, and still do, that we need something of a Marshall Plan that takes branding, marketing, yes, yes. Uh, a, a survey of the opportunities, mm -hmm. and put it right in front yeah. of kids especially. Yeah in the classroom because yeah. they will save us. Yeah, uh, and, I agree. and lots of money. Yeah, yeah. But given the opportunity and, if you will, have it sold to NSC Johnson or the Tiffany and Company, yes. um, they'll do it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you mentioned youth, that if I were to submit to a passion, it is the uh, continuing uh, responsibility, I think, that we share individually and collectively. Uh, that is to engage our young people uh, in the stewardship of their heritage, which are our parks and fish and wildlife, national forests, state parks, and what have you. And uh, Congress recognized uh, this, interestingly enough, in 1970, which is a, is a very important date to all of us who are participating in this uh, summit, authorized what they call the Youth Conservation Corps, which uh, authorized the Department of Interior and Agriculture to hire young people at the tender age of 15. Uh, to, through 18 to work in the parks and on other public lands during their traditional summer break, recognizing that we have a responsibility to develop uh, the stewards that's going to take the, the area of when we uh, <clears throat> transition elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, and I re remain optimistic that the young people are going to do much better than we have done. Yeah. 
You know, you bring up, I mean, you, you spark a lot. Yeah. Because uh, we're going to be, you know, what was it about the 70s? Uh, we're going to talk to Dennis Hayes. Yes, tonight. right. What was it about the 70s? We passed all the legislation that we're still living with now. Yes. And trying to peel back. Um, we just had the fire. We had the fire. I, I think the fire might be uh, at some times sort of latent. It has to be uh, poked, if you will, to sort of stir it up. And uh, I see that coming about. And I think this summit uh, will, has to re-energize us and call to our attention that we have to be recommitted if we are to be responsible citizens, not only taking care of those uh, invaluable, irreplaceable resources that we inherit, but all of us share a common responsibility for the air that we all breathe, the water that we drink. Uh, and, uh, but occasionally we have to be uh, reminded to get off our duff and do what has to be done. I think the millennials have it. They have the knowledge because this generation has been educated. Yes. Uh, it started uh, That's in true. these days. And um, I, I think they have it. They, they have to first be able to pay for college uh, and yes. get a job. <laughs> so they have some problems, yeah. but I, I think they will be our army for the yeah, future. Yeah, that's good. Bob, thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. It's so good to see you. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> you will lead it. We are very lucky at this summit, oh, especially My after hero. the March for Science, to be able to uh, welcome Dennis Hayes, the founder of the Earth Day Network and CEO of Bullet Foundation. He can answer all our questions. Dennis? <laughs> Good to see you. Have a seat. We were just talking about the 70s. Um, I know the kids know what happened then. But just, just listen to this. We passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Toxic Substances Control Act, bans on lead paint and DDT and a dozen other sweeping measures. We can thank you for that. <laughs> uh, and the whole movement, what was it about this? years. You know, the, the remarkable thing about that wave of legislation, and, and, and frankly, it goes on beyond even those that you cited, uh, is that it had massive positive impacts on America. I, I, I think that if you do a benefit cost analysis, easily north of uh, $50 trillion of net benefit to the American economy, forgetting what it's done to the culture and to the biology and what have you. Com Comparable probably only to the New Deal in terms of its sweep, but the New Deal was led by an enormously popular president coming out of the Great Depression. This wave in the 1970s came from the grassroots up. It was people demanding of their representatives that suddenly we start taking better care of our environment and, and our own health. We were talking, Bob and I were talking and, and uh, noting that you know, these are the citizens out there protesting the ones who were marching. And I think in this administration, I think they will have um, a chance to, uh, to really affect change. I know it's tough, but we have somebody there who wants to be liked, <laughs> and he likes nice things being said about him. I think we need to, we, we need to stick with it. Well, in, in, in fact, he is also enormously unpredictable, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to think you're right. Uh, the, the, a sometimes forgotten fact about the 1970s uh, is that because Richard Nixon signed a bunch of legislation, he sort of thought of as an environmental president. He, he was not particularly environmental. In fact, he vetoed the Clean Water Act and was really? overwhelmingly uh, overridden by both houses of Congress uh, by such a margin that he never vetoed anything else. But, but the pressure was really on Congress. It started with things like the Dirty Dozen campaign where we defeated seven out of 12 incumbent congressmen, starting with George Fallon, who was the chairman of the House uh, uh, Public Works Committee. Uh, if you wanted a road, you wanted a federal courthouse, you wanted any kind of pork, it had to go through Fallon. When he was taken out in a primary by a young guy named Paul Sarbanes on an environmental campaign, it was like the shot heard around the world. And so one of the things that I think all of these Events that we had in more than 500 cities yesterday in the March for Science, which was the theme of Earth Day this year, was really to communicate in 435 congressional districts that were watching you. 
You've got a budget submitted to you. We want to make sure that you're passing a budget that respects the needs for scientific research and also for transparency and also for the integrity of the scientific process. Give us some good news and uh, <laughs> maybe a marching order uh, for this group here. Well, there's, there's just lots of good news. Um, and for my secret love, you should never probably fall in love with a technology, but back, back in the early 1970s, I became enamored with photovoltaics. Uh, we had a, a plan under the Carter administration to drive the cost down spectacularly through mass production and get 20% of the nation's energy from all renewables by 2000. That went completely off the rails. But then it got picked up by Japan and handed off to Germany and then expanded through the feed-in tariff over much of Europe. And then the Chinese just went gangbusters on it. So today, solar, when the sun is shining, is the cheapest source of electricity for just about every place in the world. Uh, in, in Seattle, Washington, and trust me, Seattle is nothing like Phoenix. Uh, I've, I've got a six-story building that produces, a, and filled with commercial clients like Sonos, the acoustics people, or uh, Intentional Futures, a virtual reality company. It's a straight commercial tenants. A six-story structure generates enough electricity with rooftop photovoltaics that for the last four years it's run a 26% surplus over what the building is made. I mean, we, so that's big. The fact that we've got so much efficiency happening in buildings that where we used to have cars that had 8, 10, 12 miles per gallon, they're now 40, 45, 50 miles per gallon, and a huge drift toward electric vehicles. And Toyota is now betting a lot on hydrogen fuel cells, and folks have lost money betting against Toyota before. I mean, these things are beginning to pick. Uh, people are getting more concerned with their diets, uh, not only what they put in their body, but that grass-fed beef. Where does this stuff come from, and what is its impact on the environment? And perhaps most profoundly, now we're seeing um, a lot of people making decisions about how many children they are going to have for environmental reasons. I mean, I, arguably the, the best thing that I have done with my life is have one daughter, and she in turn is having one daughter, because we are well past the carrying capacity of the planet if we're going to be living in modern industrial societies. I started my grass-fed beef company uh, 12 years ago and went into Chicago with uh, no... Uh, no antibiotics and no hormones and uh, no market. Uh, <laughs> so I had to establish demand and supply. And now, 12 years later, when I'm thinking I may have to get out of the business, I look around and the market has caught up with me. And they will select now our food. And it goes beyond grass-fed beef. What is healthy? We want to know what is in, in it. And look at the big corporations that have turned. I almost fell off when I was walking down the aisle in the supermarket and I looked over to Pepsi and it said, no sugar. What? Well, <laughs> it's stevia and the others. And high fructose corn syrup has become the devil. Mm -hmm. And they even, they're even changing the name. <laughs> sure, and, and, and again, on the theme of the environment, uh, uh, so much of the American Midwest, which could be the breadbasket of the world, is devoted to growing number two dent corn, the number one use of which is to make ethanol, which is spherically senseless. I mean, it makes no sense no matter how you look at it, except that presidential candidates want to win the Iowa caucuses, and so they, they continue to support ethanol. The second is to fatten cows, which is to make the, the beef more expensive and less healthy for us. Meanwhile, growing all of that corn is causing massive erosions, it's a mass misuse of water, and it's laden with pesticides that are all being flushed down the Mississippi and creating a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So by changing those diets the way that you are trying to do, you're, yeah. you're, you're reaching well beyond just the health of the consumers. Let's talk about pesticides for a moment. You see that Dow Chemical and its scientists are asking the EPA to stall or look beyond, don't accept, the um, uh, research that 10,000 scientists and the National Academy of Sciences has done on three pesticides. Yeah. Well, it's good old Dow. <laughs> well, we've, we've been here before, and in fact, if you're looking at the strands that fed into modern environmentalism, uh, Rachel Carson has got to be one of the, the genuine heroines of that, taking just extraordinary pressure from parts of the scientific community that disagreed with her. I, 
I found myself in three separate debates with the president of the National Academy of Sciences, who was a molecular biologist, and candidly, he knew the science a whole lot better than I did. I just had confidence that Rachel was telling it right. And she stood up to all of that, despite the fact that she was in terminal cancer. And Bill Ruckelshaus, a Republican who was the first head of the EPA, an EPA that had been created for political reasons with an executive order by a Republican president, Richard Nixon, Ruckelshaus himself banned DDT. Wow. So we've got that, that potential out there still. I should put a postscript on. The reason it should scare you that Dow has asked to substitute their science for the National Academy of Sciences is that they gave a million dollar contribution to the inaugural uh, process of uh, Donald Trump. Um, I'm sorry, I know you're taping this. <laughs> what am I doing? But I'm retired. I have no problems. <laughs> Dennis, uh, you're like a hero uh, coming to us, and we're so delighted to see you. Well, Thank you very much. A thrill to be here. Bob. One last uh, uh, thought. Huh? Any specifics well, for these people? Well, the, the specifics, candidly, are in, in two forms. One is walk the talk. Uh, we all claim these values, but you need to be doing it in your personal life. Don't, don't buy a giant mansion, don't buy things that are inefficient, buy the best, if you're going to need a car at all, buy the car that gets the best mileage and meets your needs. Buy only the computer that has the amount of power that you need for your business. Do everything the best you can. And beyond that, this ultimately is a political fight. And it's going to be one in neighborhoods, in cities, in congressional districts and in states and in all of those places, we've got the capacity for victory. No matter what happens nationally, it's going to be implemented by the states and cities, and those people will listen to you. Let's bring back the 70s. <laughs> Thank you, David. It's great. Thank you. We have a great panel, uh, as they like to say on CNN. Uh, Jane Lubchenco, would you please join us? University Distinguished Professor at Oregon State University and former administration, administrator of NOAA. We're going to talk about oceans. Um, William Lawrence, a Distinguished Research Professor and Australian Laureate at James Cook University in Cairns, Australia. Uh, also, Oregon, I, I accused him of not having an Australian accent, so uh, you, know, you be the judge. And Dan Jansen, co-founder, Arietta Conservacion, Guanacaste, Costa Rica, and professor of conservation biology at the University of Pennsylvania. Quite a, uh, quite a background. Uh, he's won every uh, conservation award possible. And his wife, Winnie, is uh, here in the audience. Hi, Winnie. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, Jane, you're up first. Why don't we have a seat? Howard Shapiro. Howard Shapiro. Uh, sorry. Oh, oh, yes, Howard Shapiro. Howard Yana Shapiro, who is the Chief Agricultural Officer, Mars Advanced Research Institute Fellow, Mars Incorporated, but uh, he just joins us without any sleep from uh, Kenya, where he's working on a project there and makes us to hear about it. 70% of the world is water, um, ocean primarily. Why should we care? <laughs> we should care about the ocean because we depend on it. Uh, the ocean provides half of the oxygen that we breathe. It a, provides a very healthy source of protein. Uh, it provides uh, jobs, but it also provides inspiration and uh, in, incredible opportunities, not only for recreation, but for people to enjoy and discover 99% uh, of the habitable part of our planet, which is the ocean. The problem is the ocean is in very serious trouble. Uh, it's in deep trouble, uh, but it's not hopeless. Uh, it is in very serious trouble for a variety of reasons. Uh, the ocean today is more depauperate, it's warmer, it's more acidic, it is uh, higher, it holds less oxygen, uh, and it has lots more plastics uh, and lots more nutrient pollution than ever before. So 
some people have talked about uh, death by um, a thousand cuts. This is really by death by a million scratches. It's this and this and this and this all coming together. So the combination of climate change and ocean acidification, overfishing, pollution and runoff from the land, that's where most of the plastics and the nutrients come from, uh, and uh, climate change, uh, it, it, so climate change and ocean acidification are interacting with and exacerbating the overfishing, the pollution, and the habitat destruction. And all of that is creating a very serious problem for life in the ocean every place, at the surface, at the deepest parts of the ocean, uh, and in the coastal areas primarily, which is where a lot of the impact uh, is. It's not only a problem for life in the ocean, it's an immediate problem for people because the healthy functioning of ocean ecosystems really provides the life support system for the planet. Three billion people depend on seafood for their primary source of protein. And in the next, by 2050, we're gonna need to feed two billion more people so there's intense pressure on the ocean. So it is in trouble, uh, and so are we as a result. It's not hopeless, but it's a problem. Um, before we open it up to the uh, panelists and be sure to jump in, there is an exception. We just talked about it. Uh, is in the Philippines, a reef in the Philippines that is not bleached and dying? We are learning uh, through lots of experiences that in fact uh, there are ways to deal with a lot of these problems that I mentioned. The problems are huge and nobody would underestimate the magnitude of the problems. But around the world there are amazing new discoveries and amazing things that people are doing bubbling up all around the world. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is beginning to move beyond doom and gloom uh, we're moving to um, hope is emerging as a result of a lot of these things going on. Hope like a phoenix rising from the ashes, if you will. And some of that hope is because there are places that are in good shape. Some of that hope is because people have acted to bring back some places that have been degraded. So we're seeing hope from both sources. Uh, the one that I mentioned to you in the green room before we came on stage, Bill, was a place in the Philippines called Tubataha Reef. It's a national park. It has been, uh, it's in the middle of the Sulu Sea. It has been strongly protected, uh, completely protected, fully protected from fishing activities since the mid 80s when it was made a national park. Uh, it never had a very intense level of fishing to begin with, and now it's been fully protected. And this is, because it's in the Indo-Pacific, it is just unimaginable diversity of fishes and corals. It's, it's, it's a magical place under, underwater. Uh, but unlike most other places in the Indo-Pacific, uh, it has a full trophic complement there are tons and tons of top predators in the system. There are 12 different species of sharks, five different species of rays. So great big, huge, immense tiger sharks, which are the great whites of the tropics, um, lots of other sharks. And the system is in really good condition. When we were there uh, in last year in May, despite the fact that uh, the water temperatures were 30 to 32 degrees, much, much warmer than is normal. We saw only in five days of diving, four or five day, dives a day, we saw only a couple little segments of the reef that were bleached. And what that tells us uh, is that uh, systems it can, uh, the, the working hypothesis, if you will, is that uh, despite the warmer water, this ecosystem is in a healthy condition otherwise because it doesn't have the onslaught of pollution, of uh, overfishing, of uh, freshwater runoff, of a lot of the things that are uh, interacting with warmer waters in other parts of the world. So 
there is hope that there are places. And the lessons to be learned from that uh, are that if we can uh, remove some of the stressors in many of those other systems, while we're also reducing climate change, then in fact, we might be able to bring back some of these reefs. Yeah, like um, keeping people off the beach. Uh, Bill Lawrence. Yeah, I was just struck as Jane was talking about the changes happening in the oceans, which are profound and being, uh, well, you might notice from my strong North Queensland accent, uh, <laughs> I'm, I am actually half Australian. But uh, we live just off the Great Barrier Reef, and we've, of course, had these profound bleaching events in, in a series of bleaching events. So there's uncertainty, really serious uncertainty about what that's going to mean. But um, I also, I work mainly in forests, and I spent more than 20 years working in the Amazon, for example, and talking about these warm waters, we've seen some things happening in the Amazon that we'd never seen before. And the dogma about the Amazon, for instance, and this is where the ocean story ties in with the land, the dogma about the Amazon was that it's the El Nino. That's what determines where the, the, the droughts occur and when the droughts occur. And that was always wisdom. And then in 2005, we saw the Atlantic Ocean get so warm, it had never, it was really unprecedented. It was the same warm temperatures that drove Hurricane Katrina, which of course savaged New Orleans. Um, and as a, as, a, as a consequence of that, um, the intertropical convergence zone, which is what brings the rainfall down to the tropical latitudes in the wet season, that got pushed northward. And the Amazon went into this completely unprecedented drought. And instead of droughting in the places where you'd normally see droughts in the Amazon, which is the south and the east, the whole Amazon went under drought. Even the wettest areas that were absolutely not ad adapted to drought, hundreds of millions of trees died, billions of tons of carbon emissions were produced, and everyone said, wow, once in a lifetime event, you know, with some interaction of, of natural climatic variability and, and almost certainly human caused global warming, we'll never see it again. You know, write that one down because that's, this is once in a lifetime event. 2010, it happened again. So one of the things I guess I say, and we can talk a lot about narratives, I think we need to talk about our language, but one thing I would say as scientists, we are entering a lot of new territory. And uh, Jane, you alluded to some of the, you know, the interactions of these factors, these synergisms, these combinations of things. And in a lot of cases, we're, we have to, I think we have to be very frank to say that we're moving into new territory and there's a lot of things we don't know. And I, you know, this notion that we can't be really open about uncertainty, because if we express any uncertainty at all, then the decision makers will seize on that and not do anything. I, uh, I think the times where we actually get ourselves into a little bit of trouble, for instance, with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is maybe where they tried to just be a little bit too, um, try to act like they're perhaps a little bit more certain that they were. I think if we tell people what we actually know and don't know, quite frankly, that's alarming enough, we don't need to embellish mm -hmm. anything beyond that. There's plenty of power in that kind of message without exaggerating one bit. Howard, is Kenya still in its drought? Uh, Kenya is still in its drought. Africa will uh, suffer massively due to climate change. Uh, the, the Gold Coast, uh, now Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, that whole region will become much more dry. The real problem in Africa is a stunting. Stunting is a condition at birth. Uh, it's neurological, it's physical, and ultimately it's economic. And this is caused by not having the right nutrition. So if we talk about nutrition and the, tro the tropic st strata in a ocean where having predators and everything works together, you have a situation where the diet Pan-Africa has not been improved in probably five to 7,000 years. So the fundamental food crops have not been improved nutritionally or yield or any of the criteria that we talk about. 2011, I heard a little five minute lecture at the University of California, Davis, where I teach. And this young professor talked about stunting and she told the story about it. And you know, as scientists, we think we're worldly in a lot of ways. And I was so shocked, I mean, really to my core, that I had not been aware of stunting. 37% of the African rural population is stunted. 48% of the Indian rural uh, population is stunted. And 7% of the population in the United States is stunting. 
So we're creating, if we allow this to go forward, a condition where we have an underclass intellectually of people that have been caused not by food, but by lack of nutrition. So when I hear everyone rail about food security, what I really like to say, let's change the metaphor to nutrition security. Well, isn't that an argument for GMOs? It's actually a fundamental argument to fix the food system. GMOs are just a technology. Um, and in many places of the world, they're not accepted at this point. So I would, the work we're doing on 101 food crops approved by the African Union with an uncommon collaboration, sponsored initially by Mars Incorporated, but the Beijing Genomic Institute, uh, the CGIAR, a number of places are involved with it now, Google, uh, Illumina, the famous equipment maker. We're going to fix those 101 food crops with traditional Mendelian genetics, because that's what's demanded of us at this point. And that will be spread democratically across all of Africa. And these are the foods they eat every day. So at this juncture, we have 66 programs on plant breeding that's going on at this very moment. We don't have any foundation money. We don't have any government money. This is the new model how we have to think about getting science done. If you don't have a corporation behind you, I'm very fortunate to have Mars behind me to give me the key money to get this started. But then you have to go out and appeal to those people and institutions who do not want Africa to have 37% of its population never capable. Hmm. Jane. Yes, Bill, a compliment to fixing the food system that Howard is recommending uh, is also fixing uh, the food system of the ocean. And if you consider that 70% of the countries in Africa are coastal, uh, and that many of them are looking now toward the sea uh, as a source of the, not only food security, but job creation, poverty alleviation in what they're calling the blue economy. Uh, part of that means uh, not just doing fishing the way we have historically, which has been overfishing, but reforming fisheries so that the populations that are now seriously overfished can recover and then provide a lot more seafood and have more f uh, fish in the ocean to be a functional part of healthy ocean ecosystems. So the land and the sea here need to be more integrated. And when we talk about either food security or nutrition security, um, I'd like everybody to think about the ocean part of that as well as the land part of that. And we're learning how to reform fisheries. And that's one of the good news stories that is emerging. We've done a magnificent job of reforming fisheries uh, of, uh, in the United States. We have six, uh, the amount of overfishing in the US has plummeted by 60% uh, in the last eight years, which is pretty impressive. Uh, between the year uh, 2000 and 2015, we have recovered now um, 33 species uh, that had been previously depleted. So we can end overfishing and recover depleted fisheries. We're seeing that model be uh, adopted for uh, industrial scale fishing globally. It's not at the scale that it needs, but a lot of the momentum is there. It's the small scale fisheries that are gonna be so important to the people of Africa and people, especially in the tropics around the world, uh, that is more of a challenge, but the same principles of fishery reform that involve local communities, using good science, giving fishermen a stake in the future, uh, and having the resources to transition through this bad situation now to a better situation are part of the lessons that we've learned that uh, are bubbling up a lot of places. They just aren't at the scale that is needed. So that's, that's hope. It's the challenge, but it's also hopeful. Uh, we're leading toward uh, Dennis to give us the political answer on how to solve this. But before we do, um, Dan and Winnie saved Guanacaste of Costa Rica. Um, it's a dry forest instead of a rain forest. And I wonder if if it isn't relevant here, we're talking about drought. How did you do it? <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> there's two things in that sentence. One is the it. Um, the other is the how. Um, 
first I need to explain that uh, we're supposed to be here from the trenches when he is down there in that trench and I'm sitting up here in this trench. And um, that trench is not in this culture. That trench is in Costa Rica. It could be in Indonesia, it could be Bolivia, it could be Angola, but it's not here. So everything I say is not meant to be a blanket statement overall that would then filter down to impact everything. It's derived from our real world experiences the last 30 years of trying to take a really degraded system and um, together with a lot of other people and forces build it back up to um, what was just proposed about the fish community. You get it back into being functional and then worry about how you how you harvest the, the interest from that capital, if you like. Um, so how did we do it? Winnie and I are hardcore academic ivory tower scientists in the forest. And until 1985, the first 20 years of doing that, we didn't give a thought about conservation, about people, about the interaction with society, none of those things were on the map. And in 1985, which is probably before some of you were even born, um, there was an invasion of a national park in Costa Rica, uh, 1,500 gold miners. And in working to figure out a solution to that invasion, we found ourselves coming to the conclusion that the only way to solve a situation like that was to abandon the concept of national parks. National Parks is Smokey the Bear, a gold badge, a gun, and barbed wire fence to keep people out. That's the tropics. We're not talking Wisconsin. We realized that you had to take that object, which was being set aside and excluded from society, and put it into society in such a way that it became a welcome member, just like highways are welcome, hospitals are welcome, universities are welcome, grade schools are welcome. It had to become something of that nature that provides goods and services of all sorts in order to be welcome at the table of negotiation in the society in which it's embedded. That little preaching, if you like, embodies the concept that, uh, as I was just listening over here about water, the ocean is to me a foreign country. I know nothing about it. I don't understand it. It's complicated. I'm a terrestrial organism. And so if somebody says, what would I do about the ocean? I'd say, I'd say, I listen to people who know about the ocean. If you say to me, what would I go to Bolivia? What would I do about the situation in Bolivia? I would say, only if I were to go and spend years in Bolivia coming to understand it. So what I'm saying is no one shirt fits all. So if you want to understand where our optimism comes from, it's from taking a degraded small national park and asking what does it need so the biodiversity in it, the tropical dry forest that was just mentioned, its rainforest that comes with it, its cloud forest that comes with it, what does it need such that it survives forever? And it's not a gold badge, a carbine, barbed wire fence. What it needs is to be thoroughly embedded in its culture. It needs to be politically embedded, it needs to be financially embedded, it needs to be psychologically embedded, then it'll be welcome, then it'll survive. And that's what we've, how we've done it, unconsciously often, but making, constructing that sociologically in the country of Costa Rica. That's how we put it. And then the question comes, could you do it in Guatemala? Could you do it in Colombia? The answer is yes. If the philosophy is take a wild area and have it stay wild, but simultaneously have it become something that produces goods and services and is a welcome member of its society. And that's, what, that's how we did it. I could go on for hours about detail, that's not appropriate here. Um, but I would say that uh, the, the biggest generalizations are it's gotta be biologically big so it can sustain footprints. It's gotta be financially secure so that it is not a parasite on its society. 
and it's got to be totally embedded in the sense that the society is involved in a whole lot of things that are going on in and around it. Those boil down to specifics like employ only local people, all the staff, everybody from the director down is resident. It means you combine NGOs, we all know what NGOs are, with the power of the federal government, and you have the two working together as a hybrid operation. It means that you endow the wild area. How do universities survive? Student payments, federal grants, and endowment. You build all three of those things for your wild area. And I will stop there as a sort of beginning of a, obviously a two hour talk, which I'm not going <laughs> to do. When you say federal government paid for it, our federal government paid for the Costa Rican dry forest. Your tax dollars at work paid for the first 15 years of the restoration process. The restoration involved buildings, roads, people, salaries, buying land, and all those kinds of things. The first 15 years of that was paid for by the National Science Foundation, your tax dollars at work, which was. <laughs> the second piece was the University of Pennsylvania. When I went to the University of Pennsylvania, I went to the president, I said, can you afford to let me do something like this? And he said, we can afford a few like you. <laughs> so they have supported our salaries forever. We have a, I'm a, I'm a tenured position in an endowed chair in the university, so I don't have to worry about finding money in Costa Rica, period. The third thing is that, but I have to add to the NSF kind of search circumstances, there came a point and I have to be truthful about this, where the government of the United States said, well, since you're not using U.S. students and U.S. postdocs and U.S. sabbatical professors to do this in Costa Rica, we're not going to fund you anymore. That happened, 2011. At that point, I said, okay, this is part of the building, the shirt that fits to the circumstance. I said, all right, we'll go to the private sector. And the private sector, as individual donors, as foundations, as funds, and as goods and services earned from it for the services produced by the wild area, those things have now done the financing. Annual budget, $5 million a year for an area that's 2% of Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is the size of West Virginia to scale that to you all. Now, people say, well, that's just a little cameo shot. You know, it doesn't matter to Brazil and Colombia and the great big things. What we see in the developing world is that if one country takes some concept and applies it and makes it work, people come and look over the back fence. They don't go to the World Bank and tell the Euro Bank to tell Bolivia to do it that way. They come and visit. They look over the back fence. And they go home with the pieces that matter to them. And suddenly you discover that in Bolivia or Colombia or Brazil, or whatever, they're doing the same thing. That's how it works. Not from the top down. It works on the top down helps in the support, but in the actual act of embedding it in a foreign country, from one foreign country to another foreign country, to another foreign country, it's people seeing it work and adopting it for themselves. Right. In the terrestrial. Dennis, world. is this our future? Same Private. Uh, Dennis, is this our future <laughs> uh, of getting money, not the government, but uh, bottom up? Well, there, there are any. My, my, my ability to predict the future is exceedingly limited, but uh, I, I think not. I, I think that there is a role in a democratic polity where we choose as citizens to tax ourselves to produce public goods that are good for ourselves and good for the rest of the world, and to rely upon um, generosity on the part of the 0.0001% that we are making richer every year, to rely upon the generosity of private foundations, which are doing some wonderful things but are still tiny in terms of the overall economic impacts, uh, or to rely upon companies that are, even with the triple bottom line companies, have to be ultimately concerned with growth and prosperity and making a profit. And some of the best of them are doing some wonderful things, but those are, once again, the rare examples. 
Having people tax themselves and being willing to pay for this stuff just makes, <laughs> that's how it's supposed to operate. It worked really well for a long time. The tax revolt came along. It somehow got enormously popular, and I think we need to roll it back. If, if I could, Bill, on, on, on this placing, we're, we're talking at, at, at vast scales on this panel, which consists mostly of my heroes in the scientific community. Uh, a hundred years ago, these things weren't even issues. A uh, hundred years ago, evolution had brought us to a site where humans were having an impact on the environment, but in vast swaths of the planet, much less of an impact than other apex predators. Uh, or, or even out in the Olympic Peninsula, in, in my part of the world, uh, humans compared to, say, elk, <laughs> we, were, we were barely even noticeable in terms of our impact. That's all changed. Humans are now absolutely dominant on the planet. It's being called the Anthropocene for a reason. If you simply look at the mass of terrestrial vertebrates, Jane's got some stuff out in the oceans that I'm not going to count in this, but you look at the, the animals on the terrestrial surfaces, the land areas of the planet, human beings and our domesticated animals, our food sources and our pets, are now more than 90% of the mass. We're squeezing everything else out. And when our species is having that sort of impact, then you have to make sure that our species is doing the right thing. And what has run as themes through many of these talks is you have to align the self-interests of people with the interests of the planet. You do that by laws, by regulations, by pricing mechanisms. Um, most of the progress that we've made, interestingly, is through regulations. And I'm sad that the anti-tax revolt has now been joined by this enormously powerful anti-regulatory approach. But on the answer to your question, after all that meandering, using taxes on bad stuff to provide the revenues needed for good stuff just makes fundamental sense. Um, and so if you're looking, for example, at climate change, the progress that we've made is mostly with stuff like regulating power plants, regulating automobile fuel efficiency standards, regulating all sorts of things. If we put a price on carbon that's a reasonable price, not the 15, 20, 30 dollars a ton that people are talking about. I mean, 30 dollars a ton, which is an act of political heroism to suggest in the United States, is 30 cents a gallon in gasoline. I mean, I, I can find a 30 cent a gallon difference in gasoline by driving five miles. That's not going to cause anybody to buy a different car or to behave differently. But there's all sorts of stuff now that has been doing the analytical scientific assessment of the impacts of climate change that suggests that the correct price to internalize is $300 to $500 a ton. That's not going to happen overnight, but if we set that out as a scale and you're going to get there, then the price signal that that sends brings spectacular changes in terms of what's going to happen to climate, and it develops a revenue base that allows us to do all of these good things here that we all recognize are required. Good. You wanted a footnote. I just wanted to add, I, I gave a false impression of one thing in response to your question. Mm -hmm. the, when I said private, I, that, that, that was too narrow. What I mean is, have the wild area become funded by the circumstances themselves, which means in my case, the government of Costa Rica along with the private sector. So we have the government of Costa Rica doing their part, a big part. 30, 60% of the part, and the outside system helping with the other piece. But I don't mean go back to the United States and say, hey, United States, I want you to support the conservation of the world for, for, for indefinite. <laughs> You've got your own Yellowstones and your own Gettysburgs and all those that you need to support with your tax dollars. And the question is, then what does Costa Rica do? Does it continue to be uh, being fed by the United States, or does it recognize the value to Costa Rica of having its own wild areas and then fund them through government as well as internal private? Yeah. Bill Lawrence. Well, yeah, I was going to jump in a little bit here with coming to this narrative about, or this notion about trying to be more optimistic, and it t touches in a little bit with what we've been talking about. I haven't heard, I haven't been overwhelmed quite yet by the optimistic <laughs> note, but I'm waiting for it to <laughs> wash over me. But I, I, uh, I'm as guilty as anyone. I mean, I've given you know, many talks, and I've had a lot of people say, you know, nice talk, really depressing. And I, you know, and I keep trying to think, well, what, you know, new jokes, uh, you know, <laughs> Steve Martin rabbit ear, I don't know. What is it that one needs to do? But I guess um, 
One of the things that I wanted to say in this notion, I think firstly that people like Nancy Knowlton and other people who've been behind this event are correct in that we've got to stop dooming and glooming, it's just not motivational. So we, we still have to talk about the problems, which we're good at doing, but somehow we have to put it in this framework that it's not hopeless because we're turning off the wrong audience. I also I think we need to be a little broader about who we talk to. There's a lot of very well-educated people that care a lot about nature here. We really need to broaden. I work in developing nations, so I can't come across anti-development, for instance, at all. If I say anti-development, I've got to talk about smart development. But I guess what I want to say was this. I've seen so much change that I'm not that old. I'm, I've seen so much change in my life that I would never have expected. I saw the Berlin Wall come down, bang, and it's like, who saw that coming? We've seen technological change. Now we can monitor deforestation in real time. In fact, we're, we've got a blizzard of information coming at us because there's so much. We're trying to filter out what's the really critical stuff to respond to versus the other stuff. It's coming in, in real time. We're now seeing political changes. For instance, um, one of the things that I would never, and for years we've been complaining about some of these big corporations that have been mowing down incredible areas of rainforest for oil palm, or for timber, or for wood pulp plantations, or whatever, you know, greatly enriching themselves, or for agricultural uh, commodities. And suddenly, um, you know, sort of beginning around 2011, with some of the ones that I'm more familiar with, um, corporations came out, Golden Agri-Resources, Agri which uh, produces oil palm, and said, we are going to be we're gonna have zero deforestation in our commodity chain. And then suddenly it took off. Asian Pulp and Paper, who was the black beast, it was, one, it was the corporation everybody loved to hate, um, came out a year after that. Now there's lots of things to be, you know, nothing's perfect in this world. And many of these no deforestation agreements are highly imperfect. And Howard will know a lot about this. But the thing is this, that has become almost a new imprimatur of correctness, and now we see cargo, we see all the food commodity producers, we see again and again and again, and if you're not part of this no deforestation pledge, you're out in the cold, and you're losing market share, and you're losing, um, you know, you're becoming vilified internationally, and I guess the point is this, change happens, and change does happen, and yeah, we can see a lot of scary things happening with the environment, but we also, renewable energy, it is exploding. Who would have thought solar would have grown as fast as it is? So, you know, it isn't, okay, well, he might have, but anyway, it's not hopeless, you know, and we are incredibly adaptable, and we are kind of screwing things up, but we've got still a lot of opportunity um, to change, and I think we can, you know. The point is, well, the last thing I'll say is we've got lots of different trajectories we can take. I think it's in our, our interest to take the smart trajectories that have a healthy earth, that's what's gonna make us all better off. I, I wanna bring uh, Howard in for a moment, but you're exactly right. You know, these corporations have changed their uh, sugar, salt, and fat without being, at, uh, seeing protests in front of the building. Mm. They've caught the message mm -hmm. out there, and they've, you know, their research is telling us, hey, you better change now mm -hmm. and get with the customer. So uh, it does work. Yes, sir. One of the key points I think that Dan made was capacity building, which we don't hear about very often. But when you talk about this engaging everyone from the top to the bottom, being locally directed uh, Costa Ricans, the African Orphan Crops Consortium realized that we needed to have plant breeders. It couldn't be imposed on them. So at this point, we've trained about 100 plant breeders, all free, all costs paid for, all the labs are paid for, all the computers are paid for. And half of those people are women. So right now we're at 100. Bill Clark from Harvard once said, you need about 150 people well-trained to make a change. So our goal is 150 to 180 plant breeders trained in Africa by Africans for Africa to change this entire food system and modify it towards a nutritious system to end this plague of stunting. When you realize what that opportunity is, and I agree with you, it is optimistic. I mean, we've sequenced 27 genomes. In my lifetime, I thought I'd do one, and now I've done 27 more. And it's done with you know, great powerhouses like the Beijing Genomic Institute. The point is, we're doing it with Africans. 
and the resequencing and all the work on the plants themselves goes on in Africa. So the ability to even influence a continent, and remember Africa will be the most populated continent by 2050, and you do not want to have any large percentage of that population chronically hungry and malnourished. It's the epicenter for war when food becomes, or nutrition in my case, becomes the real demand. So as we think about these things, we think about how do we put ourselves in the position, we always have to remember it's in those places like Dan said. This is not uh, California that we could apply the Dan Jansen model to necessarily. But Pan-Africa, under the audience of the African Union with their imprompteur, you're able to actually make these sorts of changes at scale. And that's what it's at. Remember, all of us on this panel love discovery. I made a discovery, oh good lord, in my lab I feel so happy. But then you have to translate it. And then it has to go to scale. And at scale is where we really make the difference in the world. And what Jane is talking about, and what Bill is talking about, and what Dennis is talking about, and what Dan is talking about is scaling up the changes that will make the world I don't like the word sustainability, I like the word sustain agility, the ability to sustain with agility. And that's what we're really speaking about here. Mm -hmm. Jane. <laughs> and, and before you start, let me, we got about eight minutes left. So let's look to uh, 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 look, the secret sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, save us for the, for the end. Perfect. So uh, I really want to pick up on uh, the themes that you all have been articulating. Uh, and dig a little bit deeper and ask, what is it that we're learning about these good things that are happening around the world that is, that is working? Why is it working? And one thing that I keep coming back to is the power of getting the incentives right. Now, those incentives might be multiple. Dennis has talked a little bit about regulation. And regulation can be either sort of the top-down command and control, you have to do something, or it can be changing, for example, the economic incentives for something to work. And that's one of the things that has really accelerated the uptake of renewable energy in the US is getting the economic incentives right. So policy has a key role to play. But incentives are not just economic incentives, they're also social incentives. And that might be what the social norms are what my peer group thinks and what uh, helps influence. And you were talking about the Berlin Wall coming down. We've also seen major changes in public opinion toward drunk driving uh, or smoking. So we know that that's possible. How do you get to those tipping points? How do you change those social norms? But there's also individual norms, what I think is right. And I think if we look across all of these examples, whether in my world it's getting incentives right for fishermen to be able to think long-term, not just short-term, and have a stake in the future. That's what has triggered the major uh, reforms we've seen in fishery management, whether it's small-scale or large-scale, is getting the incentives right. With, in my world, also the creation of very, very large, uh, strongly protected marine areas, there's almost been a competition among global leaders to have the biggest X, you know, the biggest protected area, whether it's now the biggest strongly protected one in the world is Papahanaumokuakea in Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Uh, so there is that competition. Uh, but there's also within the private sector, uh, more and more changing of social norms. Uh, and we're seeing that in the world of seafood where the Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, based in Stockholm, has uh, connected with the CEOs of the nine largest seafood companies in the world, both fisheries and aquaculture, uh, who haven't uh, had lots of questions about climate change, ocean acidification, how is this going to affect our businesses, what's the future? And they agreed to a private conversation just with scientists. They didn't want others in the room. And they have signed on to what's called the Soniva Dialogue, uh, which is a commitment, essentially, very aspirational, uh, to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, which they have appreciated that they have been. And so 
Uh, remains to be seen how successful that effort is. They have to get concrete. They actually have to do something, not just promise. But I think it's yet another hopeful sign. And as we look across all of these hopeful things that are happening across all these different uh, parts of our world, um, the power of incentives comes up again and again. And so I think it's worth thinking about what is it going to take to change the incentives, to align the short term with the long term, to be prepared for and plan for uncertainty. Because you're right, we don't know what's coming. And so our management has to be thinking about, let's plan with uncertainty in mind. So there are a lot of things that are happening. They're not at the scale yet or the rate yet that we need. So the real focus needs to be, how do we take all these good things and have them explode. And looking toward incentives, I think, is one of the keys. Okay. We've come to the end, uh, and I'm going to turn you into TV people. You each have 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, can you wrap it up? <laughs> what, what are your observations? Mm, well, I personally, we are very, Winnie and I are very optimistic about conservation as a whole but we think we see it coming from specific, many, many, many specific cases, along with a lot of failures. So they're tuned all together. And what we see is that the successes have a better chance of perpetuating themselves than the failures do. Failures are done. The, the successes have a way of perpetuating themselves. What I see is that, that anything we can do to help those small successes, or sometimes big ones, perpetuate themselves, boost them, Boost them. Don't demand that you, 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 you guide them, perpetuate them, facilitate them. That all will add together, and I think we'll get there. Nice. See, condensation works. <laughs> Dennis? Sure. Um, a, a couple of swift thoughts. One is um, I'm, I'm really proud of the hugely sophisticated people up on stage who all spoke English for this entire period. There's, there's this tendency to get into something where you're describing it and uh, uh, and instead of using words that are understood, they are words that are understood only by your peers and sound to everyone else like you're showing off. And that, that's just no way to communicate beyond the true believers. Um, possibly the most important message that I got about communication was from the brighter part of my family, my wife. I was giving one of my typical early environmental talks, which leaves everyone in the audience seriously contemplating seppuku. I mean, just grab the sword in and fall over. And, and, and we're driving home afterwards, and she says, you know, Dennis, in, in, in Darwinian terms, uh, what is the survival value of pessimism? <laughs> and, and, and of course, there is none. If you don't have hope, then it's over. So take out of this all of these little examples that can be brought to stale, can be brought to sustain agility, and uh, let's make sure that they get there. Jane? I am hopeful. Uh, but I think that we have major challenges ahead of us. And to make that hope become reality is going to take each of us doing even more, but working together and learning from each other. We can overcome some of these challenges. They are immense. But all of you, all of the people who are watching, all the folks that have been at this summit, and all the others that we know and we connect to. We need all of us working together in non-traditional ways, but inspired by this conference, inspired by the great things that are happening around the world. We need to do this. We don't have a choice. Let's make it happen. Let's provide energy and hope and passion to have this hope become reality. Nice. Bill? Yeah, I'm almost going to echo what Jane said in a sense that uh, sometimes students will ask me, you know, what can I do? And uh, I've seen, the truth is, there's actually not that many people that really engage. And I, you know, I'll often say, join a non-governmental group and they'll tell you a lot of information and if you really get out and engage as an individual, one person who really engages can have the impact of 10,000. And the truth is, there's lots and lots of people out there who are sort of talking, but if you're really determined and you really want to do it, one person can actually make an incredible difference in the world. And I just say, 
if you care, if you really care about this stuff, you're living in the right place at the right time. I mean, this is a unique opportunity to actually have a positive impact, and uh, we really need some young leaders to do that. Curious, Howard? Well, I think that the keystone piece is to form uncommon collaborations, not the way things have been done traditionally. Uh, the African Orphan Crops Consortium and the African Plant Breeding Academy, all of the information is in the public domain. There's no IP held with the agreement of 54 presidents of the African uh, Union. My optimism, listening to my colleagues on the stage, is that I think in 10 to 15 years, chronic hunger and malnutrition will not exist in Africa. It's, a five-minute lecture I heard from a young female professor was so profound that it launched this entire program to end chronic hunger and malnutrition in Africa. And I actually think it will happen. Wow. Thank you, folks. You guys are great. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. James. Well, wonderful to meet you. After your applause. Dan Jansen, Dennis Hayes, Jane Lubchenko, Bill Lawrence, and Howard Shapiro. That's the best I've heard in an awful long time. So you can tune into uh, YouTube or whatever it is <laughs> and see it again. We are lucky because we have two more interviews, and these are with the stars, rising stars of the Smithsonian programs. First, uh, doctor, would you come out, Dr. Jennifer Nagashima, Smithsonian Institution postdoctoral fellow for the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. <laughs> Hi. You can have a seat right over here. Violating uh, my rule never to appear uh, with babies and dogs. Um, we we'll try, we'll try to overlook the, ob <laughs> the obvious. Mike Trince, would you come out, please? Trince not. <laughs> he is the technical lead for the DNA barcode of Wildlife Project, managed by the Smithsonian Barcode Network. So Jennifer, tell us uh, why Canon is so unusual. Well, Canon's uh, special in a couple different ways. Uh, first of all, he is one of the first puppies born in the world by in vitro fertilization. So he's a, a test tube puppy. He and his siblings, we took a, an egg and a sperm and put it together in an incubator and, and produced Canon. And he's also really special because he actually represents a partnership between Smithsonian Institution and Cornell University trying to solve uh, issues facing conservation of endangered canids. And what makes him really good, he doesn't urinate or defecate. <laughs> I wish, I wish. <laughs> we're, we're doing blatant bribery right now. <laughs> so what does this lead to? So we're hoping to now take this technology we've developed, it's um, 40 years in the making by researchers, to now apply it to endangered canid species. So for example, red wolves or African wild dogs. I was with your team when they went to Kruger yes. and uh, collecting semen from elephants to freeze it yes. and then um, bring it back here and artificially inseminate uh, so you, we don't have to transport uh, you know, a thousand ton animal. Um, how far along are we since I did that documentary? Yeah, it depends on the species. Um, so for dogs, we have, or canid species, we have some good techniques depending on the species uh, for freezing the sperm and transferring it, uh, transporting it across even continents. For eggs, we are still working on that. Uh, it, it's a little more complicated. The dog eggs are actually full of lipids, so they don't freeze very well. Mm. Um, but for embryos, we're able to do it. So he was actually also a cryopreserved embryo. Um, so whenever he does something silly, I'm like, well, you were frozen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, he likes they're the not play. laughing at you. They're not laughing at you. Yeah, that's right. He likes it. <laughs> <laughs> He gets nervous when oh. we start talking, yeah, <coughs> talking about those he's things. Wondering what's Mike, 
uh, the barcode project. Now, is that, uh, so if you want to buy an endangered species, all you do is pass the barcode uh, through the cash register? Sort of like that. So uh, barcode's uh, a metaphor for being able to sequence just a small snippet of the whole genome to identify an unknown sample. So uh, the whole human genome is three billion base pairs long, the A, G, Ts, and Cs. Um, but the barcode for animals is just 650 base pairs long. So it's very easy to, to sequence, and you can reliably tell what an uh, unknown sample is. How much more do you have to do? Um, so the, the Barcode of Wildlife project, which we started, kind of uh, identify or targeted endangered species. Uh, so uh, uh, Dan Jansen and, and Winnie, they've barcoded tens of thousands of uh, butterflies in Costa Rica and uh, Guanacaste. Um, but so if you came across an unknown uh, butterfly from Costa Rica, you could very easily tell what it is by sequencing it. Um, but you don't have that kind of coverage for endangered species. So that's what the Barcode of Wildlife Project was for, was to fill in those gaps to make sure that if you have an unknown sample from a protected species, you would find a good match for it when you sequence it. Filling in the gaps is a good phrase. The first question I think I ask of one of my scientists as a new explorer in the Amazon is, uh, why do you do this? And uh, you don't have to answer. <laughs> uh, he said, well, can I think about that all night? So the next morning I said, why do you do this? And he said, because it adds one more little piece of information about how the world works. And I thought that came as close as anything. Thank you, too, and congratulations you so for much. being stellar. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Canon. Thank you for being such a good audience. Uh, I learned something, specifically stunting. I had never heard about that in Africa. That's amazing. It tells you exactly where you should be working. One little footnote that I have, um, I'm an advocate of uh, conservation easement, uh, we talk about incentives. Uh, instead of just going out and asking for money, uh, which uh, you will have to do to continue all this, but what's the incentive? Why should people contribute? And the conservation easement is interesting. You can, did I, my, I also do a, a series called American Greed, so let me reflect uh, what I've learned <clears throat> from that. You can deduct the value of your property that you have lost between the market value and essentially what uh, it is without the ability to, to build. To build, you're, you're right. To use it for commercial purposes, uh, like a subdivision and things like that. And uh, once you start having a job and making money, that is unbelievably invaluable as an incentive. So we can do it. Uh, and conservation easement is just one small tool. Good luck. As Buckminster Fuller told me, now you know the truth. It's up to you to do something about it. <laughs>